Well, good morning, church. It is so good to see you all this morning. December, the first Sunday in December is a special Sunday to me and to my family uh, because it marks the anniversary of coming to be with this church family. It's been four years now. I, I always say every year it doesn't seem like it's been this number of years, but after 2020, it seems like it's been that and maybe a little bit more, but uh, it's not because it's been unpleasant. Uh, you have shown us, my family, even through this year, uh, just what a wonderful outstanding, amazing church family this is. I could not be more thankful uh, for the staff with which I get to work, for the shepherds. We have absolutely the best elders in the world, I'm convinced. Wonderful, wonderful people with whom to work. And this church family, each and every one of you, you give my family and me more and more reasons every week to say that we love you and we appreciate you so very much. Before I get into this morning's lesson, I want to tell you about a TV show that I've recently uh, come to enjoy. The, the premise of the show is that they take 10 contestants and they take them individually to different spots and they drop them off in the wilderness miles and miles from anybody else. So they're all by themselves. Each one is all by themselves. And they, they have to you know, find shelter, make shelter, find food, find water, and, and generally just survive. And they, their goal is to just survive as long as they can. They have a radio, and whenever they want to, they can call and say, I'm done. They can tap out, and they're done, and they get to go home whenever they want to. Some people leave after a day, and some people stay for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And so as long as they can, they just stay there and try to survive. And one by one, they all decide, it's time for me to go home. Either they get hurt or they get cold or they just decide it's time to leave and they, they go home. But the last one, of course, he doesn't know that he's the last one. He doesn't know that everyone else has gone home. One day, the, the TV crew, the, the camera crew and the producers and one of his family members shows up to tell him, you won and you're the last one and he gets half a million dollars. And so it's kind of a cool show to watch and we've really kind of enjoyed that. But what's amazing to me is the number of people that go home not because they couldn't find shelter, not because they couldn't find food, not because they couldn't find water. They had everything that they needed. They just, they just got tired of waiting, and they just, got, they just got tired of it, and they just decided, I'm done, I'm ready to go home, and so they just left, and they, they lost, not because they weren't smart enough, not because they weren't strong enough, because, but because they simply lacked the will to wait, lack the will to wait. And I've been giving a lot of thought to that idea lately of waiting. And this year, this year has really revealed a couple of things about waiting, hasn't it? One, it's revealed the need to wait, right? That sometimes that's all you can do is just wait, just wait. Sometimes that's all you can do is just wait. And this year has really sort of revealed that to us that in some ways that's all you can do is just be okay with things not being okay and just, just hang out and just wait. Wait for things to get better. And, and then it's also revealed the challenge of that because that's really, really hard to wait. In fact, I would say that waiting is countercultural for us. Waiting is countercultural for us. We live in a culture that doesn't, that doesn't, award waiting. We live in a culture that doesn't celebrate waiting. They don't build monuments to people who are really good waiters, right? They don't build monuments or they don't sing songs or write stories or make movies about people who did a really good job at just waiting. In fact, words in our vocabulary that we celebrate are things like initiative, right? Self-reliance, ingenuity. We want to go do something, right? We, we tell little proverbs, right? We say things like a rolling stone gathers no moss, right? Yeah, so just do something, right? In fact, sometimes between doing nothing and doing the wrong thing, we would almost rather do the wrong thing than do no thing, do nothing, right? We say the early bird gets the worm, right? So get up, go do something, right? We don't award or celebrate waiting. And so waiting for us is an incredibly challenging thing. But if we really read scripture and we take the Bible seriously, from the beginning to the end, sometimes we have to recognize that sometimes 
It's a moment where what you're supposed to do is simply wait for the Lord. Just be still and know that he is God and wait for the Lord to show up. Wait for the Lord to make things better. Wait for the Lord to keep his promises. And I think we can recognize, can't we, that throughout history, there have been some of God's people who have lost the race. They've lost the race, not because they weren't smart enough, not because they weren't talented enough, not because they weren't skillful enough, not because they lacked knowledge, but simply because they lacked the will to wait. They lacked the will to wait. So every week this month, we're going to talk about a different carol. And the word carol means joyful song. And and think about some of these joyful songs that we sing. Some of them may be super familiar. Some of them may not be oh so familiar to you. But we're going to talk about these joyful songs. And today's joyful song that we just sang is a song about waiting. Waiting in joyful hope, waiting in joyful anticipation, knowing that God hasn't done what he promised yet, but he's going to, and God is going to keep his promises, and we are going to wait on the Lord. So let's look at the song again and think about some of the lines. It says, O come, O come, Emmanuel, come, God with us, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here. Until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here. Advent means appearing, by your appearing here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to flight. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Now, you you probably know that Emmanuel means God with us, right? God with us. But do you know the story behind the word or the name Emmanuel? It's only used in Mark chapter 1 and in the book of Isaiah. So maybe we're not real familiar with the context What is meant by, what's the story behind this word, this name, this title, this description, Emmanuel, God with us. In order to understand the hopeful anticipation that goes along with this word, Emmanuel, we have to go all the way back about 730 years before Jesus to the time of King Ahaz. King Ahaz was a young king in Judah. I think there's a map that's coming up next. And Maybe. Yep, there it is. So King Ahaz was a young king in Judah. And Judah at the time was this tiny little country. Not only a tiny kingdom on the world stage, but a tiny kingdom even in its own area. And and of course you had these big kingdoms like Assyria to the east and Egypt to the west. But, But then Ahaz, as soon as he became king, he had to deal with this this uh, coalition between Israel and Syria, that they joined forces probably to rebel against Assyria, and they probably wanted Judah to join them against Assyria, and Ahaz was like, I'm not going to do that, and he wouldn't join with them, and so they wanted to overthrow King Ahaz and replace him with a different king of their own, sort of a puppet king, so that they would all be one coalition. Now again, can you imagine 20 years old, You become king of Judah, and it seems like the whole world could at any moment just come crumbling in on you to have all of these kingdoms all around you, and then Israel and Syria are joining forces against you to attack you, and he, of course, was absolutely terrified, shaking like a leaf. He was terrified of Israel and Syria, and so God sent Isaiah to Ahaz with a simple message. A message that God sent to his people many, 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 many times. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And again, those words seem seem so encouraging to us when things are good. But when things are hard, 
when you have two countries that have joined forces to take you down, to take you out of power and put a new king in your place, for God to say, don't be afraid, maybe, you know, you might say easier said than done, right? But God comes and says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of Israel. Don't be afraid of Syria. Don't fear them. I'm with you. Do not fear them. Don't worry. They're not going to come to anything. This, this coalition that's come against you, this alliance that's come against you, it's going to come to nothing. I know it looks and seems scary, but I'm with you. Don't be afraid of them. They will not win. They will disappear. Look at Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. So Isaiah comes to King Ahaz with this message and he says, God wants to give you a sign, a sign that he's with you. A sign that you don't have to be afraid of Israel and you don't have to be afraid of Syria. You don't have to be afraid of these kingdoms. You don't have to be afraid of whatever they're plotting, whatever they're conspiring, whatever they're going to do. You don't have to be afraid of them. And God wants to give you a sign. What do you want? Anything. Ask for a miracle. He'll give it to you as a sign that he's with you. Ask for any sign that you want. And Ahaz, and it sounds so pious, doesn't it? It sounds so nice. He says, oh, no, 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 I, I won't, I won't put, the, put God to the test like that. But he's not really a pious person. And he's not really being sincere. In fact, it's pretty hypocritical. In other words, he's, he's just saying, no, 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 I, I, don't, I don't need anything like that. The reason why he probably doesn't want a sign that God is with him is he's probably already decided what he's going to end up doing is giving his allegiance to Assyria, to the pagan empire of Assyria, because he wants Assyria to come and save him from his enemies. And so when God says, hey, give me any, any test, any sign, I'll give you whatever you want, as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven, whatever you want, I'll give you a sign to prove to you I'm with you and you don't have to be afraid of them. And Ahaz says, no thanks, I'm good. Verse 13, and so Isaiah said, hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. You, you don't want a sign, but you're going to get a sign anyway. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the days that Ephraim de departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. So in other words, you, you didn't want a sign, but a sign is going to be given to you anyway. A virgin is going to conceive and give birth and before that boy is old enough and has been grown enough to, to know right from wrong before he's an adult, the two kings that you're terrified of will be deserted, will be destroyed. Assyria is going to come in and take them out. So here's the sign. The sign is that not a hundred years from now, not thousands of years from now, but in a very short time, the people that you are so afraid of the people that are making you shake in your boots, the people that you're considering throwing away your loyalty to the Lord, your faithfulness, because you're so afraid of them, they're going to be gone. This is the sign that God is with you, the sign of Emmanuel. And of course, the sign of Emmanuel was true. And that in a very short period of time, in a very short period of time, these two kingdoms of Israel and Syria were destroyed by Assyria who came in and took them out. And there was nothing to be afraid of. All he had to do, all he had to do was what? Wait. Just wait. Just wait. Just be patient. In a very short period of time, all of this will be over. All of this will be done. In a very short period of time, you'll be rescued. You'll be saved. You don't have to be afraid. But Ahaz refused to wait. 
He refused to be patient. He refused to trust in the Lord. He refused to hope in the Lord. Instead of saying, yes, Emmanuel, God is with us. He said, no thanks, I'd rather have Assyria with us. And we know that temptation, don't we? We know the temptation to say, well, yeah, I mean, that's all nice and good to say God is with me and I don't have to be afraid, but I'd really rather have a huge military behind me, right? I'd really rather have something powerful, something strong, something I can touch, something I can see, something I can sink my teeth into. That's what I want so that I'm not afraid. That's what I want so that I feel secure. And Isaiah says, you don't need that. You have God with us. Just watch. Just watch. This child will be born. Just watch before he's grown. Your enemies will be defeated. Just watch. Emmanuel, God is with us. You don't have to be afraid. All you have to do is wait. Trust in the Lord. But Ahaz refused. So here's what God said to Isaiah. Look at chapter 8 and verse 11. Isaiah 8 and verse 11. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people. (laughs) Listen to these words saying, do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy and do not fear what they fear nor be in dread. Worry is the enemy of waiting, right? Worry is the enemy of waiting. Waiting is hard enough. Waiting is hard enough without worrying. If you worry and you say, what are they up to? What are they up to? What are they doing? What are they doing? And those people are conspiring against me and those people are plotting against me. And what if these people get stronger? And what if those people get stronger? And what if this happens? And what if that happens? You will inevitably cave, right? And God tells Isaiah, don't call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. Don't fear what they fear. Don't dread what they dread. Don't be like this people. Believe the sign of Emmanuel. I am with you. Don't be afraid. Wait. Trust. Hope. But worry is the enemy of waiting. Waiting, real waiting, true waiting, faithful waiting is about joyful, hopeful anticipation. When the church says hope, we don't mean maybe. We don't mean it's possible. When we say hope, we say it's a certainty. That's what hope means in Scripture. Waiting in Scripture, waiting for the faithful, waiting for God's people is about hopeful, confident expectation and anticipation. Not worried, saying, I don't know what's going to happen. And what about these people? And what about those people? And what about these people? Believe the sign of Emmanuel. God is with us. And that's all they had to do. Isaiah, all he had to do was just wait because it's going to happen pretty soon. And the enemies that Ahaz was terrified over, the enemies that caused him to give his loyalty and allegiance to the strength of Assyria, they would be gone like that. Look at verse 13. But the Lord of hosts, and I love that term, don't you? The Lord of hosts multitudes. Some translation says the the Lord of angel armies. The Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. He says, don't fear what the people fear. Don't dread what the people dread. Don't call conspiracy everything they call conspiracy. Don't be afraid of armies. Don't be afraid of what people might be plotting. Don't be afraid of what's going on behind the scenes. You want to know what to be afraid of? Be afraid of the Lord. You want to know what to fear? Fear him. It's his strength. It's his strength. Because here's what God can be. God can be one of two things. God is either going to be your sanctuary or your stumbling block, right? 
The Lord is either going to be your sanctuary and you're going to say, he's my refuge. He's my rock. I'm going to put my trust in him. What can man do to me? I'm not afraid of anybody because Emmanuel, God is with us. And you take sanctuary in him or he's your stumbling block. And you say, I, no thanks. I, I don't need that sign. I don't need God with us. What I really need is this strength over here, this power over here, this thing over here, this thing I can put my eyes on and put my hands on and put my trust in. That's what I want with us. And if that's the case, then you're rebelling against him and stumbling over the stumbling stone. And the Lord tells Isaiah, this is going to be the case for both houses of Israel, both Israel and Judah. They're not going to put their trust in the Lord and hope in the Lord and wait on the Lord. They're not going to let the Lord be their sanctuary. He's going to be their stumbling block. And they're going to say, no, it's just too hard. It's just too hard to really believe that God is with us. It's just too hard to believe that I, I shouldn't give my allegiance and my loyalty to these other Things and kingdoms and kings and peoples. It's just too hard to trust. It's just too hard to hope. It's just too hard to wait. I, I want something I can put my eyes on and put my hands on and put my trust in. And they will stumble over the stumbling block. And the same story plays out generation after generation, doesn't it? The Lord keeps telling his people, I am with you. But most of them stumble over the stumbling stone. Most of them don't put their trust in the Lord and hope in the Lord and wait on the Lord. But there is a remnant, a remnant who do, who say, I see the sign of Emmanuel. I see that God is with us and I hope in him and I trust in him and I will wait for him. Look at what Isaiah says in chapter 8 and verse 16. He says, bind up this testimony, seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents or warnings in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. Isaiah says, I believe the sign of Emmanuel. I believe God is with us and I will wait for the Lord and I will hope in the Lord I will wait I will hope I will trust God will show up God will deliver his people God will appear but others like Ahaz said I won't I won't I won't look at the signs I won't trust in the Lord. I won't hope in him. I won't wait for him. I want something and I want it now. But a remnant of people did exactly what Isaiah did. Said exactly what Isaiah said. I will wait for the Lord. I will hope in the Lord. For 700 years the remnant of Israel waited. Look at Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, took place in this way when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit and her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. And you may know that Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua. Yeshua. Yahweh saves. God saves. It's the same name actually in Hebrew as Joshua. Yahshua. Yeshua. Jesus Joshua, it's the same name in Hebrew. Joshua being the one that God allowed to deliver his people, save his people from their wilderness wandering and bring them into the promised land. And the angel tells Joseph, this, this child whom your fiance has in her womb is from the Holy Spirit and his name will be Jesus, Yeshua, 
Yahweh saves because he will save his people from their sins. For hundreds of years, even though the people of Israel had come back to the land, they were still in exile. They were still waiting in exile, still in their sins. The presence of God not returned. And they knew it. They knew that they were, they were waiting and hoping for the day that Yahweh would show up to deliver them out of the wilderness and into the promised land, a new Joshua, someone to save them from their sins. Their exile had not yet ended. And they were waiting. In verse 22, Matthew adds as a commentary on all of this. And he says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And I think what Isaiah, or what Matthew rather, is saying is, it's more than just, this is what Isaiah predicted. It's more than that. It's more than him just lifting this verse out of Isaiah, out of context. He's saying Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of all of this, of all of our hopes, of all of our expectations. He is the ultimate fulfillment of what Isaiah was trying to communicate to Ahaz. God is with us. All you have to do is wait and hope and trust and be faithful to him. And he's going to show up and he's going to deliver and he's going to save. You just have to wait on him. God is with us. Trust him, hope in him, wait for him. And the events of Isaiah's day and Ahaz's day were a sign of Emmanuel. A sign that God is with us. But Jesus is more than a sign. Jesus is Emmanuel. Jesus is God with us. And, and so we, we kind of bring this all together. And, and we might say, first of all, that in one sense, in one sense, our waiting has been fulfilled, right? Right? In one sense, our waiting has been fulfilled. The waiting that God's people had for hundreds of years for a new Yahshua, Yeshua, Jesus, Joshua, to come and deliver the people out of the wilderness and into the promised land. Someone to lift the exile. Someone to take away the sin. Someone to offer atonement for God to show up, for God to be with us. So in one sense, that's been fulfilled and God has shown up. And done what he said he was going to do and save the people from their sins. And even us, the Gentile nations, we've been added to the family of Israel. So now this has become our story. And the waiting of all of Adam's children, Jews and Gentiles, has been fulfilled. But then in another sense, we're, we're still waiting, aren't we? And still praying, O come, O come, Emmanuel. We're still waiting for the end of sin and death. We're still waiting for Jesus to show up again for his second coming, his second advent. We're waiting and praying and singing, O come, Emmanuel. But we have to remember all of these stories. Remember that we're, we're waiting, not in doubt, not in fear, not in worry. We're waiting, not calling what all of them call conspiracy, conspiracy. Not waiting in worry, not waiting in fear, not waiting in dread. Waiting in anxious, confident expectation and anticipation. Knowing, rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel will come to you, O Israel. We know this is true. It's already begun in Jesus. He's already shown up. He's already kept his promises. And so this second period of waiting is even easier than the first. Now, I heard a story this week about a preacher that was working hard on his sermon and he was almost done. I mean, he was about an hour from being finished and his daughter came up to him and said, Daddy, can, can you come and play with me? And he said, oh, Baby girl, I wish so much that I could come and play with you right now, but, but I can't. It's going to be about an hour, but in an hour, I will come and I'll play with you. She said, okay, I'll wait. I'll wait for that hour. And, and so she, she left the room, but as soon as she got out the door, she made a U-turn and just ran back to her dad and just gave him the biggest hug she, should, she could possibly give him. And he said, I thought, I thought you were going to wait 
And, and she said, I wanted you to know, I wanted you to know what was to come. I wanted you to know what you were waiting for. <laughs> I wanted you to know how good it was going to be. That's what Jesus has already done for us. We already know what we're waiting for. We already know how good it's going to be. We already know, Emmanuel, God is with us. We already know what to expect. We already know what we're looking forward to. God has already shown up. And so, yes, we are waiting, but we're waiting knowing the resurrection that's that's coming. We're, we, we're waiting knowing the God who's coming. We, we're waiting knowing the Savior who's coming. We're waiting knowing what we're looking forward to. So here's my encouragement for us this week. Cultivate a will to wait. Cultivate a will to wait. This year has revealed to me both the need to wait and the challenge of waiting. The challenge of waiting. And how I need to work on me. I need the spirit to work on me. I need the gospel to work on me. So that in me I can be intentional about cultivating a will to wait. We have to fill our vocabulary with words like eagerness, longing, anticipation. Because when we know what we're waiting for, and we know how good it is, and we have these words as keys in our vocabulary, anticipation and eagerness and longing, then we won't give up. We won't give up. When somebody says, yeah, but, but you could have this right now. You could have this right now. You could have this pleasure right now. You could have this security right now. You could have this confidence right now. You could have this feeling right now. We say, no thanks. I know what I'm waiting for. No thanks. I know what I'm longing for. No thanks. I know what I'm anticipating. We have to be intentional about cultivating within ourselves a will to wait. Because church, listen, nobody who has ever really waited on the Lord has ever been disappointed. Some people are still waiting. In fact, in a, in a way, we are all still waiting. And we have not yet been disappointed and we will not be disappointed because no one who has ever really truly waited on the Lord has ever been disappointed. And we know, Emmanuel, God is with us and he will show up and he will keep all of his promises. And so if there's somebody here this morning and you're ready to enter into that story and put your trust in Emmanuel, Yeshua, the Lord who saves, the God who is with us by being baptized into Jesus, by being restored to him and to his people, or just to ask for prayers or for encouragement, one of our shepherds would love to meet you at the information desk as together we stand and sing this song.